Uh, just to uh, recap just a little bit what we've got going here. Uh, we're looking at the teshuva that was written on the use of electricity and electronic devices on Shabbat. And for the first uh, 29 pages so far, uh, we've been dealing with trying to understand what is the definition of malacha. You know, when the, you know, we're told on Shabbat we should not do any malacha, any type of work. Um, and especially how they have the, you know, and we have the 39 categories of uh, work that defined in the, in the Mishnah. And what, um, is it David at What's Nevins first? Daniel Nevins has been doing here is going through the different, uh, several of the different categories of work and some of the subcategories and see how it applies to the use of electricity. Um, I think just to use this paragraph to summarize our discussion so far. We have concluded that opening or closing an electric circuit should not be prohibited as form of built, well, gone to using the category buildings, that the warning, warming of wires is not cooking, and that the generation of light and electrical appliances, <coughs> excuse me, including incandescent bulbs, which heat metal to a close, should not be prohibited as either cooking or burning. Thus, there is no comprehensive ban on all uses of electricity as malacha. On the other hand, we have found that the use of electricity to generate heat for the sake of cooking or heating air and water is forbidden as a derivative of cooking. Even without the use of fire, we have also noted that new appliances should not be used for the first time on Shabbat and that devices should not be assembled on Shabbat. That is by replacing the bulb, the battery, or plugging the appliance into a socket. Our discussion of Malacha so far would result in a ban on operating any electrical appliance designed to generate heat for the purpose of cooking food or heating air or water on Shabbat, but would not ban the operation of circuits in general for other electrical appliances. Okay. More? So, yeah. So there, there raises a question I never thought about before. Does that mean that in the winter time you're not allowed to run your heater, whether it's electrical or gas, to heat your home? Uh, it doesn't say not run it. It says you cannot plug it in. Okay. In other words, if there, if you had a heater, and even one that used uh, a thermostat to go on and off, as long as it was plugged in before Shabbat, you can certainly keep it on in Sh on Shabbat. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, how about watching television? How about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, at this point, he's just saying, if it's not, generating heat for the purpose of cooking food or heating air or water, uh, there is no outright ban. Um, we'll discuss TV a little bit later because it's a gray, I, I consider it a gray area. But for the next several pages of uh, the teshuva, which I'm gonna skip through, um, he goes through some other subcategories of Malacha and, um, and points out that there are ways of saying, okay, we could, we could do it on Shabbat. Uh, writing is a little bit of an issue and the question is <clears throat> the use of, elect of, of, of uh, computers, especially those that automatically record anything that you're doing uh, it becomes a little bit of a question of whether we could use it on Shabbat. <coughs> uh, we'll get back to that also in a different, from a different way. Um, 
so I want to turn now to you know, move ahead and, and look at what he's calling this non-formalistic <laughs> definition of malacha. Um, one of my, my favorite books is called The Guide to Jewish Religious Practice by Rabbi Isaac Klein. Um, one of the reasons I like this book is that I have it in mimeographed form, not Xerox, mimeograph. Uh, because uh, when I was at the seminary, uh, Rabbi Klein used the um, manuscript of the book, which he had mimeographed and passed out copies uh, to us in the class. And we used it as a text on learning uh, Jewish life and practice. Um, it's a very good companion. I don't know if it's still available. I have my copy here, but um, for, a, for a while there, it was uh, the, uh, shall we say, the Shulchan for uh, conservative observance. And at the beginning of the book, he goes to, uh, he gives a definition of what should be considered uh, Malacha and Shabbat. And Rabbi Joel Roth uh, kind of reworded it a little bit and it's quoted here. So until now we have considered classical definitions of Malacha and their relevance to contemporary electrical and electrical appliances. However, it is worth understanding a modern approach which adopts a non-formalistic definition. Rabbi Joel Roth, in agreement with Rabbi Isaac Klein, cites modern theological writings from scholars as diverse as Samson, Raphael Hirsch. Do you guys know who he was? I see a couple of nods. Any, any shakes? Okay, so we'll keep going. He was a... Uh, an Orthodox writer in mid mid 19th century in Germany, um, very often quoted, you know, as some of the begin in the very beginning of what we now call modern Orthodoxy. And anyway, he has Samson Raphael Hirsch, Mordechai Kaplan, and Abraham Joshua Heschel to argue that the classical ban on malacha is meant to prevent people from exercising mastery over their environment. In addition, the standard methods for identifying malachot by comparison to established forms, Rabbi Roth writes that any activity which demonstrates mastery is by definition forbidden on Shabbat as a malacha, even if the intention is not similar to that of the established category of malacha. In other words, the issue of evaluating the permissibility of any given action is not only whether it resembles a forbidden category and mechanism, intention, or a result, but also whether it generates, it demonstrates mastery over nature. Rabbi Roth considers operating electric lights on Shabbat to be biblically banned as malacha, since they demonstrate mastery over nature. Following the example of Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Shimon ben Lachish as cited in the Yerushalmi, he classifies such actions on the general category of makab patish. Turning on an electric light may not resemble any particular category of malacha, as we have seen. As we have seen, the rabbis prohibited cooking and burning, not making light, but it would still be forbidden, according to Rabbi Roth, because this action demonstrates mastery over nature. Uh, uses the term makeb fatish. Anybody familiar with that term? Ah, got a good one here. Makeb fatish uh, literally means striking with a hammer. But the rabbis adopted the use of this term to mean the, um, the act of completion finishing off a, a, some type of, of other activity. So in other words, uh, when you strike the nail with a hammer, that's, that's a pretty uh, final, final action. So anything, you know, like um, 
well, it's according to Rabbi Roth, anything that shows demonstrate mastery over nature is a, an act of completion and, and similar to what he calls makeb fatish. Okay. How, how widely um, accepted is Rabbi Roth's interpretation? Um, funny you should ask that. Because the next paragraph says, this approach is initially persuasive but problematic on several levels. In other words, um, when Rabbi Klein initially put forth the basic of this, a lot of us thought this is pretty good, but now he's going to argue that whether overall it's a decent statement, but there are some, there are some issues with it. Um, David, I think you kept talking about the uh, 39 times 39. So here we go. The Yerushalmi text bears the hallmarks of Agada, claiming that these rabbis had identified 1,521. Is that the, the math yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Forbidden forms of labor, but giving no examples. What does it mean that they found labors? Were they relying on neural traditions or making up their own system? When they assigned miscellaneous actions to Ma'akeb Fatish, did they have any rubric? This Yerushalmi text gives us no useful information, which is perhaps why it's not citing in the, cited in the halakhic codes. Okay, he kind of put that one down. <clears throat> um, but, he goes on here that what Roth is saying, the theory of mastery is to explain the purpose of banning Malacha as no source in biblical or classical rabbinical late literature, as Rabbi Roth concedes, and it seems unwieldy in practice. In fact, resting on Shabbat is in itself an assertion of mastery. So we're kind of left with a, um, I think, with an open statement here, but one that I think still gives us uh, a decent guide to uh, how we want to define um, what it is we do and don't do on Shabbat. Uh, he says, rather, it appears to us that with, with their 39 categories of malacha, <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> the rabbis were concerned with making permanent, permanent or at least durable changes to one's physical environment. Labor's indication of inadequacy, inadequacy of lack, and Israel's commanded on Shabbat to rest and appreciate the resources they already present. Until recently, such activities absorb the greater part of the day for most people. Resting from exertions on Shabbat is a weekly form of thanksgiving. Nevertheless, Rabbi Roth is certainly correct to focus on the intention of any given activity as relevant to whether it should be permitted or forbidden. While we may not agree with this line of reasoning with regard to Lacha, it is going to be useful when considering the secondary level of Shabbat restrictions called Shavuot. Okay, so they, we're, we're left here that really what we want to talk about is what is the intent of the activity? Um, thus, to answer your question about TV, uh, what is the intent? Are we going to do it as a form of relaxation uh, or if we're listening to uh, or watching a documentary, is it education? If is it watching uh, the talking heads on cable, is it for uh, increasing our stress and getting us all frustrated and upset uh, or whatever? So it's, I, I'm gonna leave it as a wide open question because it comes back to your intent. What do you wanna do with it? Why are you doing it? And you know, have it go from there. Because also, we now also, also, I think, isn't it 
be interesting to use sort of a logic of it's, it's different than what you would otherwise do on other days. So, for example, you, you're watching, when you said the talking heads on cable, I wasn't sure whether you meant David Burns band or you meant, <laughs> but I think I figured it out. But if you watch, if, you, if you're watching that stuff, you know, CNBC, for example, you're watching it all week. And then on, on Shabbat, you decide to watch the History Channel. Is that, you know, enough of a difference to distinguish Shabbat from the rest of the week? I mean, do you think it is? I, I don't know. I mean, I, for some people, it, no, I'm, it, I'm serious yeah. about that type of answer because it's intent. Um, I can see, and, and I'm not going to tell people who want to do that, that they are wrong to do it. Um, it's a diff, you know, it's, it, it's educational most of the time. Um, certainly entertaining. Uh, I would say uh, I'm not showing any uh, mastery over nature more than you know any any way else. And I know a lot of pe people who like doing that. Um, as long as they go to school in the morning and then do that in the afternoon, uh, you know. So I, I think it's it's that's why I say when I leave it open is a is a wide open question. Um, you know, the same thing that we used to say, you know, I, I like going home, turning on my radio and listening to, uh, when it isn't Saturday afternoon when the uh, Metropolitan yeah. Opera have their weekly broadcast, right. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my neighbor immediately next door, when he's here, he listens to it uh, religiously. Um, no pun intended. No, well, no, definitely. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I I think it gets down to uh, you know, what do you want your Shabbat to look like or feel like? And maybe that's the good segue because I mean, if if Shavuot, you know, the concept of resting is is it as important but also important, then it may help define the intent. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just, just want to jump in for a second. It, it, I'm, I, I'm hoping we can dispense with Rabbi Roth's mastery of nature concept because when you look at it through through a, uh, uh, a through a uh, an ecology lens, um, almost almost any activity that engages technology. Is going to is going to be an, an expression of mastery over nature. So you you I mean, you'd have to throw out anything that was that was technologically based because you're intervening in nature at that point. Use of indoor plumbing. <laughs> uh, I, um, I yeah, I agree with you. I, um, we. But uh, I'm, we're not going to throw it out completely. I think this concept of mastery of nature really um, was something that was uh, formulated um, before computerization took over our lives. Um, and uh, before uh, digital circuits uh, took over just about everything that that we can uh, we can think of, but yet as as we get into this whole question of Shabbat and and what we're going to define as what we want Shabbat to look like, uh, there's going to be some times when we say, um, I do this all during the rest of the week on Shabbat. I want it to be different, and therefore you know, fill in the blank. Uh, I will or I won't, you know, do something. Are you just waving or is that, uh, hmm? we're just are we going like this or just? I'm just scratching my head. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's look at Shavuot. Um, <clears throat> 
we know it says Sheshet Yomim Taseb Seb Masecha over Yom Hashvit Zishpot Laman Yanuach Shoracha Bakamaracha Vinafash Ben Amitecha Vahager. I think I screwed that up a little bit. All right. Six days shall you do your labor, on the seventh day you shall rest, so, so that your ox and donkey will rest, and your servant's child and the stranger will relax. Okay. There are a couple other places that we have this concept of Shavuot, but we'll start off with this one. This verse differs from those examined it at the beginning of the Teshuvah regarding Lacha. Instead of prohibiting the Israelite form, the Israelite from working on Shabbat, it gives us a positive commandment to rest. The Torah is interested not only in creating an eternal state of tranquility, but also in fostering a public atmosphere of rest, which includes not only the free Israelites, but also his or her livestock and servants. The command to rest is repeated further on in Exodus, and there are numerous references to guarding Shabbat and to making it and other festivals into a Shavuot or a day of rest. You know, um, so we see that we have on one hand, we're saying, no work shall you do, but it also is explicitly stating you should rest. Um, I always find it interesting, and it points out the, um, you should give your animals also the, the, a day of rest. Um, but when I discovered in a big way, when I spent three months on a religious kibbutz way back in the early, in my prior existence, that somebody on Shabbat morning, somebody had to get up, get dressed in their work clothes, run over to the barns and the chicken houses and take care of the animals which I guess really illustrates the difference. One, they're being taken care of. You know, the cows had to be milked. You know, uh, I don't remember if they collected the eggs, but definitely they had to put out uh, food and water for all the animals. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's even the animals were included and we now have to, uh, decide what it is, what we mean by rest. Now, the teshuva goes into, again, a really long discussion, mostly going through different texts, both biblical and rabbinic, um, which, frankly, um, I recommend if you want to go through the document. Um, I didn't load it on the chat this week, but if anybody wants it, I certainly could do it. Um, but it is on the BCBI webpage. Uh, and David put it in there on the page where you go to sign up for uh, virtual events, right? It's, it's on the page where um, it shows the study group. There is also a, a copy of that that you can download. Um, but I wanna jump, jump to, the, to the summary Am I on the right page? Yeah. Um, of what he calls, of what he calls Shavuot. So we're dividing it into three categories. It's a decree to prevent a violation of a malacha. Um, in other words, we try to avoid certain activities because it could get us into other trouble. Um, he says, we don't climb a tree lest we break a branch, nor make legal rulings lest we want to write it down. So the act, Mort, that, yeah. Mort, is that why um, we don't play musical instruments lest we break the strings? Uh, it's one of them. Um, musical instruments, I think, are in a, uh, uh, 
it, it somewhat gets complicated because some, some of it has to do with the fact that after the destruction of the temple where music instruments were played in the temple on Shabbat, uh, that we refrain from it because we can't play them in the temple. And there's other, some other things there. But yes, the idea that, you know, uh, say for example, if you're, you're plucking a guitar uh, and your string breaks, um, it's malacha to fix it. Um, a better example is riding a bike. Um, and in essence, uh, riding a bike, there's nothing wrong in and of itself with riding a bike on Shabbat. But if the bike breaks, you can't fix it. In other words, if, you're, if your chain goes off of the, uh, you know, the cogs, you can't put your chain back on, strictly speaking. Um, if you get a flat tire and you're outside in the public domain, you can't pick up the bike and carry it home. Okay. Uh, you can get on and ride it with the flat tire, but you know, that's okay. So a lot of people prohibited the use of riding the bikes. Uh, when my kids were little, I said, come on, let's go for a bike ride. Uh, okay. That was within the air roof. Uh-huh. Uh but yeah, no, it's because we're surrounded by water. We have two rivers and... Uh, oh, okay. There's got to be a river that makes us an island here someplace. Uh, whatever. That's, that's so interesting because... Um, when I lived in Maryland, I used to bicycle to synagogue, and um, it was so much more work than driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, on the other hand, when, when I lived in Tucson, uh, I used to ride my bike over to Hillel on Friday night, and I always took a shortcut through a church parking lot. And I ought to be careful because the driveway at the far end occasionally have a chain, had a chain going across it. So I always made sure to look to see if the chain was up or down. One time I looked and it looked like it was down, but it wasn't. <laughs> Enough said. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, again, uh, Malacha, as we can see, is not defined by physical labor. And did you feel exhilarated by riding your bike? Did it give you a sense of, uh, of inner peace? I think that's smart. No, because I had to ride on, on you know, two-lane roads and the cars would aim for me. <laughs> so, so we got to ask the question, why did you do it in the first place? I thought it was more uh, religiously acceptable than than turning on a car. Okay, there you go. I, but I'm learning that perhaps not. No, I wouldn't argue that. Um, no, I, I, th I think you know if if you, I, I was I was going to the extreme by saying that you could say, well, you're saying it's religiously acceptable. But I, I, you know, I know a lot of people when they get off their bikes say, oh man, I'm so exhilarated. You know, that's, um, that's it's really a strong, you know, inner feeling. And yeah, if, if, if you got that, hey, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so actions done in a way distinct from the biblical prohibition. Liability for performing Malacha and Shabbat is limited by the restrictions of actions and intentions as described previously. As we saw, writing is defined as forming two letters using durable ink on a durable sur surface with one's dominant hand. Absent these conditions, the action cannot be considered the biblical Malacha of writing, yet the rabbi still prohibited rabbi writing in a different fashion. Um, basically, you know, the category of Shavuot, you know, is a, in a very important way, some of the fences that we 
you know, that we put around the letter of the law and try to refrain from it. Okay. And the third and perhaps most interesting category of Shavuot describes activities which are truly distinct from the Malachot, but are considered incompatible with Shabbat rest. From a very early time, commerce was considered improper on Shabbat, not only because it might lead to writing, but because Shabbat was designed to be a day of delight. In Isaiah's words, uh, Isaiah's words were understood to exclude business dealings uh, from Shabbat. So too was the Tircha uh, Yitera, the excessive exertion, considered to be forbidden under the category of Shabbat. For example, one should not carry heavy furniture up and down stairs within the home, even though this is not banned as Malacha, either by Torah or by the rabbis. Okay. So to summarize, the use of many electronic devices undermines the distinctive tranquil nature of Shabbat or Yom Tov. For example, turning on a radio or television may not involve any form of malacha, yet it introduces audio and video, which are broadcast from another locale bringing with them music, news, and commercial advertisements, which may distract the listener from his or her immediate surroundings and from the special atmosphere of Shabbat. Shabbat. Using the phone can also shatter the distinctive culture of Shabbat as a day focused on one's immediate surroundings and the people with whom one is making Shabbat. Shabbat is a day dedicated to localism, as the Torah says, one should not leave his place on the seventh day. Okay. You can only, you can only watch your, your local public television station. Well, he's, he brings in that distinction. <laughs> um, I, um, I don't completely agree with that distinction. Um, and um, I personally uh, don't like his blanket uh, prohibition either. Um, because I think it's, you know, like David just said, you know, when he thought riding his bike was a more acceptable form of religious observance, I can see how, how some people will con consider listening to radio TV as being restful and relaxing. Um, you know, even now, especially now when we're, we're dealing with Zoom, where, what, today we had people in the Poconos. I, I, you know, Art, where are you? I'm in Yardley. Oh, in Yardley, uh, or people down at the shore, or who knows where. Um, <laughs> you know, we're all together, you know, in our... Um, our, our one little room, our one little Zoom room. Um, and I'm not sure I, I want to make that distinction. Uh, I Actually, I heard Nemans talk a couple weeks ago, uh, and he pointed out that uh, when we do, um, in his point of view, when we do a Zoom minion, he felt that everybody should be in the same uh, at least 10 people should be in the same city to form the minion, not just in the same call. I, I think that's picking hairs. But, you know, because I think it's the same thing he's saying here. He's consistent, and I'll be consistent in saying I, I'm not sure it's, in, it's critical. But that's just my opinion. Or I, I said one question. Those three categories that you had shown before, so if, if, are these categories which Nevins sort of came up with, or just by his, you, you just passed it, it was, sorry. 
Go down a little further. Another no, page. They, they, he's drawing that out of the rabbinic text that okay. are above. Okay. So, so and, and if it fall, if something falls into any one of these, then he would treat it as he would consider that to be prohibited. Because the first one's the one that's the most troubling, because it's really, I mean, it, 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 it's almost as if the the shavut side has really no independent meaning because you're still focused on those things which could have been um, malacha. I mean, you never get, if that category alone was the criterion, then I think, you know, it'd be hard to figure out anything that would, that would not be prohibited you know, based on rest. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out how, I, I know it's not, I, you know, you know, because in another place he does say, if you want to take it too far, then even the idea of getting up and getting out of bed goes against, um, you know, could go against this category. You know, you know, uh, are we going to get up, get dressed, and notice that? Oh my goodness, there's something on your shirt. Do I want to try to get this stain out? Right. Uh, or you then, read the newspaper. You can't read the newspaper because there's a chance you might tear it. <laughs> or or get upset by the news itself. <laughs> uh, uh, or receive bad news, but no, that, that, not a possibility. That's a certainty. Um, so I, I, I think we want to establish this as a principle, but not get too, too, uh, you know, take it too far, because I think it does have that danger of doing exactly what you say, of making life so prohibitive um, that we won't do anything. And I don't think that was the intent, nor do I think that that's really uh, what they want to say. I mean, I think that in the spirit of, of trying to attract more people to um, religious observance, my own view is the concept of the distinction drawn between Shabbat and the rest of the week is probably like the, uh, the best tool to do that. And then as people adopt that kind of view, they may likely move, you know, more towards the more, possibly more towards the traditional side, but at least the, the demarcation and the distinction drawn between Shabbat and, and, other days and other activities because remember there are a lot of people with a lot of different circumstances they deal with and for some of them um you know trying to draw a line for them is going to be exactly much much harder than drawing a line for somebody else exactly you know and um you know my experience in dealing with especially with uh, people who are converting um i find that s some people um uh, you know, don't want to wade into the water. They want to jump in head first, um, you know, and tell me everything it is that I shouldn't be doing. You know, um, not only do I want to separate two types of dishes, I want to go straight to the eight different types of dishes. You know what the eight are? You have everyday milk and flesheth, are good everyday, are good, good flesheth and milk. Pesach, Pesach, and Melchik. And then when we have the guests over on Pesach, you still need another two. Yeah. In other words, um, there are some people who just want to jump, you know, head over heels. And I caution them not to do that. Because if you're going to strive to do too much and you miss your mark, then you get frustrated and full of guilt, and you jump back to nothing. It's rather to bite off little bits, you know, go waiting first, you know, dip the toes in, do a little bit here, a little bit, you know, do a little bit for a few weeks, then add something else that self to that, and add something to that. And then before we all know it, we've got a guy who's ready to go and, and move to Mea Sharim, and we want to know what happened to that guy that used to run around with uh, dreadlocks and a beard, right? 
Uh, that's the Chabad. That's the Chabad approach. Well, it's not only Chabad. I mean, right. Chabad. But, that's that, but that's absolutely right. It's absolutely you know, right. Yeah, Chabad does do it, but they do some other things we won't get into. Um, but I mean, if you think if you think about just different kinds of forms of tefillah, if the only acceptable form of tefillah was to do it the way an or, you know orthodox shul does it. You're, you're, only, you're not going to have a lot of people who are necessarily going to, to uh, be attracted to that, either because they don't understand it, it's going to take a long time to understand it, it's, it's, it's something that's, you know, very, very difficult. If you say to them, oh, well, we're going to have yoga to fila, or we're going to have, you know, some other, you know, meditative to fila or something, this is something that's more approachable, it's something they're more apt to adapt their lives to and in time you know exactly with more with more added to it uh it has it has a greater impact exactly yeah or even even the use of english you know you know uh or whatever language um i always loved it when when people say can we pray in english i said well there's a reason God invented English because he understands it. Um, you know, or Chinese or, you know, whatever other language. Ta Is that the language never, of the people, I, Mort? I'm sorry? Is that the language of the people that he understands? Um, <laughs> how would you answer that? <laughs> I would say yes. Uh, Oh, dear. The, 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 the thing that's a little problematic about all this is, I mean, if you take the orthodox approach, you more or less know what to do. The alternative approach that we're discussing is obviously a hell of a lot less normative and really about the, about the most definitive thing you can talk about is the intention and the goal rather than the actual practice. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely, except your first statement. Um, in orthodoxy, yeah, I know. you don't. You know, orthodoxy, orthodoxy would have the same discussion we're having it, but look at it from the other end. You know, instead of us skipping over those pages with the text, they would go and be picking them apart to figure out which... Uh, which restriction they could put in. You know, they are, we used to kid around that in some Orthodox communities, they would have what is called the Chumrah of the day. A Chumrah is a, you know, you can go, uh, you can be makel, which is lenient, or or be, uh, go to the, it's not Komer, it's uh, Machmir. You want to be Machmir, which means more strict, um, you know, be more picky, you know, um, you know, I, you know, I could talk about my Muncie Lakewood uh, cousins again, uh, you know, and some of the, you know, I'll give you a good example. Last time, one of the last times that we were up there um, to visit, uh, Carmi brought some strawberries so we could, you know, have a little treat with the kids. The mother of the house that we were at took the strawberries in the kitchen and peeled them. <laughs> You ever peel strawberries? <laughs> she took off all the seeds because who knows, there might be some bug hidden in uh, the seeds. I felt like saying, what happened to the principle? If you can't see it, it's not trace. Um, but I, I, I didn't want to get into that. But yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll go. Uh, it's not necessarily that clear, even in orthodoxy. Um, well, I have a principle. If you're looking for a problem, you can find one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. So let me uh, just uh, show you his uh, summary here. And um, if Shabbat and Yom Torah is to succeed in focusing the mind on Torah, and, on an, and an appreciation for the nature, natural environment created by God, then we have a positive reason to avoid digital distractions 
and make Shabbat a day like unlike any other. Of course, the same may be said about reading newspapers and business journals. Ideally, one should spend Shabbat reading and discussing Torah and other subjects which increase one's sense of appreciation for the world and which do not engage one in business. However, most of the Shabbat observant community does engage in reading secular literature on Shabbat, and this has become normative. Nevertheless, the principle of Shabbat indicates that one should make special effort on Shabbat to study Torah and to avoid subjects such as business and finance, which are antithetical. I can never get that word out. To the spiritual focus of the seventh day. Under normal circumstances, one therefore should not use a phone, radio, television, computer, or any electronic device which distracts attention from one's immediate surroundings. Yet, what about the use of digital devices necessary to protect human dignity, such as hearing aids or the use of a phone to check in on an isolated and vulnerable person, or the use of a motorized chair cart or lift to help a disabled or frail individual get about the home or congregation. Such questions pit the value of Shavuot against competing Jewish values such as human dignity and call for nuanced prioritization. Well, then he'll have the, it says it's a focus of what comes next. Um, but yeah, it gets to the point, I think it's, it's like how he concluded the whole question of when we're talking about Roth statement. Um, it's ultimately, I think what he's saying here, ultimately it's impossible to make any type of blanket statement about the use of electricity and electronic devices. Um, I, I use my hearing aids. I use my CPAP machine on Shabbat. I know of people that will not use the CPAP machine. Um, I don't know anybody that deliberately doesn't use their hearing aids. Um, but um, but why, why would they not use their CPAP machine? Isn't doesn't the Kuach Nefesh uh, yeah. prevail? Well, in their understanding, you know, the use of electricity uh, overrides the fact that you can get away with one night without using it. Uh, not my choice. I'm not going to defend it any more than that. Um, but I, I, I use mine religiously, especially on Shabbat. But, but, but on the other hand, if I take a nap Shabbat afternoon, I don't use it. You know, no deep thought involved in that. But no, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, people come up and can look at these things very differently. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure I can really argue, argue against it. Um, we can have our understanding of why we do do it and why we feel it's important. And if they can, they are are uh, firmly fixed in their mind that they can not use it and that's their understanding of Malachan and Shavut. Uh, so be it. Um, if we want to watch TV in Shabbat afternoon, it's the same as they're, they're not turning on their devices. Okay. Um, hey. Wait, let me look just here. I'm we we're down to Well while you're scrolling, can I can I just say I don't know if this is appropriate to say now. I, I guess I, what I do see where I sort of align with what he's saying, although although I agree, yeah, making blanket statements doesn't seem to work. Um, but I guess my my person, personal approach. I'm not saying this should be any everyone's approach. Is, is I don't. I guess to in this kind of virtual, virtually oriented world, and which is often to our advantage, especially during a pandemic, right? And we're doing it now. Um, but 
is to, I guess, think about Shabbat as being a day that we can take in which we can sort of try to pay attention more to like texture around us. So to use like virtual things a little bit less, devices less. I mean, like I personally don't like don't email and don't use sort of electronic devices on Shabbat, like for that reason. So, so, so I understand that idea of emphasizing like what's present and physical around you and proximate and, and, and if we're thinking, and that's consonant with the idea of having Shabbat be different and have be a day of different emphasis from what we're doing the rest of the week. I mean, legislating it in a stark way doesn't work, right? But it does have a logic that aligns with right, the various principles. Right. Um, and to, to add to that, what I think is happening, you know, that's what we consider Shabbat and how we want to form our attitude to Shabbat. When we get to something like this, to Shuva, where we, we need to get down to the nitty gritty and we start examining uh, some of these sources and we can see, you know, the thinking that goes into some of the background material can get really down to the uh, nuts and bolts things. And that takes us to extremes where we don't necessarily want to go uh, and realize that we don't necessarily have to go. But in order to come up with the, the, um, the norms or the legislative uh, legislative norms, shall we call it, um, we have to get into some of these things. Sure, and, and, and I'm, look, I'm grateful for any legal flexibility, and I still use my electric toothbrush on Shabbos, and I do not feel guilty about it. So, so yeah, I mean, so, yeah. Oh, I forgot about the electric toothbrush. <laughs> I mean, I thought about it, and I, you know, and I decided. Yeah, I do, I, I use mine too, especially when Dennis says it's more important for me. It's it's better for me to use. But yeah, there uh, there justifies my pikuach nefesh. Okay, um, uh, my dilemma is that right now is that we have just a little bit to go on this, and we're really running out of time here. Um, oh Lord. I vote we stop here. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to think of is there a way I could just give you. Uh, all right, then let's do this. I think we can just a few minutes, you know, finish up these last couple pages. And then we said we would get into the actual Teshuvah about using uh, um, Zoom and other type of. Uh, platforms for uh, on Shabbat for services. Um, so I'll finish this uh, next time. We'll finish this up and start on that Teshuvah. Okay. 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 Yeah, sure. uh, thank you so unless much. You guys, unless you two guys are too fed up on dealing with analyzing and picking apart Teshuvah, then we could get into something else. Okay, and no response to that, so no, we'll good. stick with the original plan. This is interesting. I mean, I just, I, I know I'm not here every time, so I I, I have any authority to <laughs> say anything. <laughs> well, all I can say is that do, download the, uh, the the document and you can go over it. For me, it's very helpful, um, this discussion. I'm not, I don't come that often either, but, you know, even if it just helps us set individual parameters for what we do on Shabbat and how we navigate electronics, even if we're not that machmir about the exact rules, the discussion itself, I think, is very informative and, and, and uh, for me, it's very helpful. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, this was great. That's your call off, Mort. That's your call. Thanks, Mort. That's your call off. Keep boosting my ego. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> thank you. No, seriously, thank you, everybody. Oh, um, you too, and you were great. It's a lot of fun. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So long. Bye.